All right, so this morning I'm going to be preaching on the subject of communion, which is also known as the Lord's Supper. Uh, both of those terms, first of all, are, are used in Scripture. I don't have a problem with, with either one referencing the, the observation of, of Jesus Christ's death and, and what happened when he had the, that last supper with his disciples and, and what he was symbolizing, what he was showing for believers to do thereafter. Um, you know, a lot of people don't like the word communion because it sounds, you know, the Catholics use the word whatever a lot and they've got a false version of taking communion and stuff like that. But it's a biblical term. I'm not going to turn away from it. I think it's fine. I actually, I actually think it's a great term and we'll get into this a little bit, a little bit later, but just communing with the Lord and having communion with our Lord Jesus Christ, I think it's an excellent term. Obviously, we don't believe in transubstantiation, which uh, it's a long word, but what the Catholics believe is that Jesus is, when you eat that wafer that they give you or you drink the wine, that it's, you're literally eating the flesh of Jesus Christ, that like the wafer turns into his flesh like while you're eating it, that there's this miraculous event that happens that you're literally eating the flesh of Jesus Christ, which is really, really bizarre and just shows how pagan the Catholic Church's beliefs really are to think that you're literally drinking blood and literally eating flesh when you eat a wafer or drink some wine. That is, that is absolutely insane. And yeah, we don't believe anything like that at all. <laughs> But the word is still there, uh, you know, communion or um, the Lord's Supper. So I'm going to be teaching about this. Now, I am convinced of, uh, in my beliefs on how we ought to be uh, holding communion and, and, you know, participating in the Lord's Supper. I don't have any doubts about this. But that being said, I know there's other people that believe a little bit different on this. And I think that's fine because there's, this is one of those areas in Scripture that isn't spelled out just to a T of exactly how everything needs to be done. Like I said, I think I, I'm, I'm very confident in my beliefs on this, which is why I'm teaching on it, which is why we're practicing it the way we do. I've thought about it quite a bit. I've read a lot of scripture on it. And, and my conclusion is I'm, gonna, I'm just going to show you and explain to you why I believe what I believe about this and why we're going to practice things the way we do. So, um, Let's start with 1 Corinthians 11 because this is an excellent chapter that the Apostle Paul is, is essentially writing to the church at Corinth. Now, just right off the bat, the church at Corinth has a lot of problems. 1 and 2 Corinthians, those are letters written to a specific church in Corinth where they've had problem after problem. There's a lot of carnal Christians there. They have all kinds of things that need to be set in order. And it's important just to lay that foundation first because there's so many times where he's just saying, okay, look, you guys are doing this and that's not right. And he's just setting things straight. And this is no different. So what was happening here, with the, even with the Lord's Supper, is they weren't doing it right. So there's a lot of things that he's trying to correct them on. And the chapter even finishes basically saying, and whatever else is lacking when I show up, you know, I'm going to take care of that too. So whatever I haven't covered here, whatever is still going on that's not right, we're going to take care of all of that. But that happened outside of what we can read in Scripture. So let's start reading here in verse number 18. The Bible says, For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, if we were to stop right there, you can say, well, I guess we don't eat the Lord's Supper in church. And then it's got to be some other practice. But when you continue on, because he starts off, the reason why we're starting to read in context here in verse number 18 is, He's, he's already starting to say, look, I already know there's divisions among you, and I know that there's heresies, and I know that there's problems. And that's why he says, when you come together, therefore, 
It's because of these divisions, it's because of these heresies, because of what's going on. He says, when you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And then he explains in verse 21, for, why is it not to eat? For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Does it sound like they've got some problems there? Absolutely. It sounds like things are not being done decently and in order. It sounds like there's people just coming in, they're hungry, they just want to eat their meal, they don't care about anyone else, they don't have a, a humble attitude of esteeming others better than themselves. They're coming in, one's hungry, one's drunken, and they're doing everything wrong. But just to show you, if you, if you jump down to verse number 33, and we're going we're gonna to go through all this in context anyways, because in verse 20 he says, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, but then he says in verse 33, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. So first he's saying, you know, hey, look, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper. And then he explains why it's not, why everything they're doing is wrong. But then after he gets that clear, he says, well, now when you come together to eat, implying that you should be coming together to eat. OK, when you do this, this is the way you do it. So I, do, I just want to make that point. That's why I think this is something that as a church that we practice. Now, obviously, when, the, when Jesus Christ was showing his disciples this, it wasn't the entire church gathered together. He was having this Last Supper with his disciples. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I don't think that's just showing that everything has to be that way. He was on a time limitation. Okay, this is right before. And, and let's, let's clear this up, too. So one of the reasons why we observe communion, what we're doing this Wednesday, we're doing Wednesday before Easter. Is And I'm not going to get into all the details. I've preached an entire sermon on this before. But basically, how long was Jesus Christ in the grave for? How long was he dead for? Three days and three nights, right? That very, does anyone need help understanding that from Scripture? That is evident. So what day of the week did Jesus Christ rise again from the dead? That we have in, or what, what day was the tomb empty? Sunday morning, right? First day of the week. They showed up to the tomb. Tomb's empty. Okay, if we could do some simple math and then go backwards from that day. Jesus, first of all, was not crucified on a Friday. And look, I understand we're using our calendar system. It's what we understand. But there were seven days in a week back then. There's seven days in a week now. We're going to use our terminology. Okay, first day of the week we call Sunday. That's when Jesus Christ was already risen from the dead. It was empty. So he wasn't dead in the grave on that day. It was, he was already gone at the, at the dawning of the day. Okay? So if you go backwards, you've got Saturday, Friday. That would only be two days, right? And Thursday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, he was dead. Jesus was crucified at even on Wednesday night. That started basically the next day that was the beginning of thursday the, the the again this doesn't really matter but we start our days at midnight right so at midnight tonight at 12 a.m it's going to be monday morning the hebrews started their days at sunset at the sundown that was the end of the day starting the new day right it's kind of arbitrary it doesn't really matter you have to pick a point somewhere in the 24 hours to make the division, the dividing line of saying, this is the day before, this is the next day. So they did it basically when it gets dark at sunset. Kind of makes sense too. You say, okay, the day's over. So now we're starting a new day. Okay. Um, so basically he started that Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three days, three nights, dead in the grave, resurrected, tomb is empty on the first day of the week. So that Passover, that particular Passover had um, no one doing work on that Thursday, no one doing work on that Friday, and no one doing work on that Saturday because it was a regular Sabbath. And then, um, of course, he was risen again on a Sunday. So we, when it, when it comes time for Easter, because that's the resurrection is what we celebrate on Easter Sunday, we commemorate this, uh, the Lord's Supper on the Wednesday before, just because this is kind of close to when he would have been doing it with his disciples. That's why we choose the day that we do. 
and I'll get into this a little. There's a lot to kind of get into, but I want to maybe have you thinking about these things right now, and I'll get into more scripture backing them up as we continue through the message. So um, we do this, and, and I think once a year is an appropriate time to, to honor this and, and show this because I think it's a continuation of, of uh, Passover. It's basically a, a Passover for the New Testament. Obviously, things have changed. We're not sacrificing lambs. That's what they did with the Passover, showing the death of Jesus Christ. And they did that once every year, and it was a very special event. And we're going to get into all the things that, that line up between the Lord's Supper and the Passover and, and how it's basically a New Testament version of recognizing and honoring the fact that Jesus Christ died and, and gave his body and his blood was shed for us the same, the similar way that the lamb had, was slain and its blood was shed, you know, showing the future while well, we're looking back at the past when we hold communion of the Lord's Supper. So, um, I think it's more of a continuation of that same recognition of what Jesus did for us, which is another reason why, since that was done once a year, we're going to observe it here once a year. To me, it just, it, just, it just makes sense and it fits together very well. Now, there are other verses in here that can lead you to think that, okay, you know, you can... You can um, hold communion or Lord's Supper more, more often if you want to. And I'm not opposed to that. I don't believe that, but I just, I'm not opposed to that. And w the reason where people will think that is um, it says in verse 26 here in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So they say, well, as often as you do this, well, as often as we do it is once a year. I mean, that's, that's as often as we do it. He's not saying, I don't think, but personally, I don't, I don't read this as saying, well, if you do it every month, you know. But um, again, I, this isn't something I'm going to just, just argue with someone over either. If that's what you want to do. If you're, if you're going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and give respect unto his body being broken and his blood being shed, then amen. I mean, how can you really argue with that, especially when this isn't one of those things? Because God's very specific in many areas on how we ought to worship him, on, on what he wants us to do. And God's given, especially in the Old Testament with the sacrifices and stuff, God was very specific on the way he wanted things done. And they needed to be done the right way. But when there's areas where it's not extremely specific on what you have to do, I think God gives us liberty to be able to do things in the way that we seem that we deem to be appropriate. And I believe this to be one of those areas just because it's not nailed down. But um, let's, let's continue here. He says, let's go through some of the problems they were having. Verse number 21. For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. So it sounds to me like people are bringing their, their supper and they're eating before other people. And, you know, some people have stuff, some people don't. Some people are hungry, some people are drunken. And there's just this more of like a free-for-all going on with the food being eaten in the church and there's just no order to it whatsoever and people are treating this more as like a main meal than a somber event of of recognizing what jesus did for us when jesus christ and we'll see this too we're going to look back at the in the gospel when he he, he broke bread and gave to them and then passed the cup of the wine this isn't, that wasn't like some full meal that they're having in order to honor, you know, to, to, to symbolize the broken body and the, the blood being shed. That aspect of it, I'm not saying they didn't eat when they were together, but the, the aspect of, hey, we're holding, this is the Lord's Supper, we're holding communion, we're doing something to commemorate what Jesus did for us. That part of it, that aspect that is going to continue moving forward for people to observe 
is, is, uh, was not some huge meal. It was not some big feast. And this is what he's basically condemning him for or rebuking him for. He says in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And this is what he's referencing. This is what he's talking about. This is, he's saying, this is what Jesus did. He took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. This is a very pivotal moment because this is kind of separating the Old Testament from the New Testament. And this is the New Testament in my blood. Right? When Jesus Christ dies on the cross and sheds his blood for us, this is the entering in of the New Testament. He's, he's like, he's at the cusp of this with his disciples saying, okay, here we are. This is now the New Covenant, which is the New Testament. It's a better covenant. It's a better testament. It's his blood being shed. And he's saying, Hey, take and eat. This is my body. And he's symbolizing him being dying for their sins. And he's symbolizing his blood being shed. And he's saying, I want you to remember me. Remember that I did this. Do this in remembrance of me. And he's referring to the bread and the wine. And then he says in verse 26, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. And this is why we continue to observe this year after year is because he's saying, hey, as often as you eat his bread, you're showing the Lord's death. You're showing that he died on the cross. You're showing what he did for us until he come. Now, he hasn't come back again. So we're going to continue to show the Lord's death until he come. Verse number 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Now, before I even get any further... Again, I'm going to give you my explanation of what this is referring to. It's pretty plain here, but first of all, when it says, He that eateth and drinketh unworthily, the, the very first place we could start with that is, if you're not saved, you shouldn't be partaking in the body and blood of Jesus Christ, because that is definitely unworthily. If you haven't put your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you shouldn't be participating in this event and, and commemorating because think about it, if you don't even believe it, if, you're, if your trust isn't even in Jesus Christ, why in the world would you be commemorating the, the, the death and the, the sacrifice that Jesus made if it's not even something that you believe, right? If it's not something you hold to be true. Uh, but this is also, just so you, you understand this, I'm going to go over this on Wednesday as well, but um, this is only for saved people. Now, you don't have to be a member of our church of like being on some member roles or whatever to, to participate in, in communion or in the Lord's Supper. But I do, the way that we administer it here and the way it's going to happen on Wednesday is that the head of the household, whoever is here, is going to be administering to their family who gets to eat and who doesn't. Because you'll be responsible then for your own children and your family who's going to participate and who won't. Um, so I want dads, if you're here, to be responsible for making sure whoever in your family deserves to get it. Because I don't want our ushers or whoever's going to be helping to administer this to be the ones responsible in deciding which you know, children are allowed to, to partake and which ones aren't. So either dad, if dad's not here, mom will be the one making sure that, that they know who in their family is saved and who's going to be participating and who's not. So uh, this, is, this is serious. I mean, this is a big deal. That's why I'm taking time to go over this, and I hope everybody can understand that, that when we, when we do come together and we do uh, observe the Lord's Supper, 
the Bible says here, hey, if you drink unworthily, you're guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And it says, uh, for this cause, so for this reason, because people are eating and drinking unworthily, it says, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So there's some people that are, you know, that are physically ailing as a result of this, as a result of eating and drinking the body and blood of, the, of, of our Lord unworthily. When, when they shouldn't be doing it. And some people, it says sleep. Right. Some people are dead, have died as a result of this. Now, I also believe, I think the very clear surface is, is you're not saved, you're eating and drinking unworthily. That is without question. I also think, though, that people should be self-examining Kind of where you stand with the Lord. If you're in the midst of just some sin, right? And a, a way to think of this is, you know, the, in the Old Testament, people, you had to be clean. You had to be sanctified in order to partake of the Passover, okay? We don't do the, the washings and those carnal ordinances anymore. But because this is a continuation and because the way that this is worded here when he says, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, I think this is referring to people who are already saved. Not just, not, I don't think that the church was just full of a whole bunch of unbelievers and many of these people are just, you know, all of these unbelievers are partaking in the Lord's Supper and then they're just dying and getting sick and stuff. I think this is more towards the believer who's not clean in their life. Again, we're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. But there's a difference between, you know, just being in sin and knowing you're in sin and you've got some, some problem that you think is causing a problem between you and God and having more of a clear conscience and being right with the Lord. Okay? And this is why it says, let a man examine himself. Examine yourself. And I, this is something to take seriously. And if you think about it, well, why would some people be weak and sickly and some people die? Like, why would it be different? If it's only just unsaved people, well, why wouldn't they all just die then? Or, why, you know, why, why would it be kind of different like, for one unsaved person versus another? That's another reason why I don't think this is just talking about people who are not saved. I think this is talking about people who are maybe at different levels of, of just kind of not being right with God and being unclean, as it were. And again, we're, we're going to get into the, the Passover and show you all the connections and all, all the associations and, and why I, I think these apply just perfectly. They fit in with the way that you observe the communion versus the way that the Old Testament, they observe the, uh, the Passover. There's, there's so many aspects that just fit together. And I'm not going to be able to get everything in one sermon. It's going to be already probably a little bit longer. So I encourage you all to study this out for yourself. It's an interesting study. It's an important study. I mean, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ, it, it, it deserves study. That's right. When we commemorate that, read this and, and study and meditate on these passages. There's not very many passages that deal with this in Scripture. So read through and just study. Read over and over again. 1 Corinthians 11. Read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have basically the same Gospel account of the, the Last Supper. John records it, but it doesn't have all the information that the other three do. And we get to that in a minute as well. But um, study these things out. And then go and look on the verses about Passover. And, and study those and put them side by side. And I'm going to try to do some of that for you, but... Like I said, there's a lot of information that we need to kind of absorb and I want to be able to teach on. So one more reason why I think this isn't just talking about people who are unsaved. It says in verse 31, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. He's drawing a distinction there about believers, children of God, who are chastened of the Lord, were disciplined, were punished by God, but were not condemned with the world. So what's happening is that people are being chastened and disciplined by God because they're eating and drinking unworthily, but they're not condemned with the world. 
There's a distinction there. And the fact that he even mentions this all in context, I think, gives us more evidence to say, yeah, it's not, he's not just talking about people who are unsaved. This is talking about people who are just not right with God. And this is, a, th on Wednesday, it's going to be a, you know, a somber occasion. It's, it's reflective. And, you know, everybody's at their individual choice. It's better, think about it, it's better to be right with God and make sure you're not doing something they shouldn't be doing than is to worry about, oh, well, what's someone going to think if I don't take the bread, you know, if I don't, don't worry about what anyone's going to think because that doesn't matter. What matters is what God thinks. So just wherever you're at, you decide, examine yourself. That's between you and God. It's not between anyone else. And no one's going to be looking around and checking to see, hey, did, oh, brother so-and-so didn't, didn't, didn't take the bread. Look. There could be all kinds of different reasons and you don't, you know, no one, no one needs to be worried about that. You just decide for yourself whether or not you want to, um, you want to participate. No one's going to be watching or anything like that. But again, even if people were, it's do what's right in God's eyes. That's what matters the most. So then he, he finishes up here in verse 33, wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. What does that mean? Wait for other people. Let's all wait and do this together. Let's not have, you know, some people come in. Oh, man, I'm, I'm glad we're doing the Lord's Supper tonight because I'm hungry. I come prepared to eat, you know, like, you know, give me two of those. Give me three, you know, and, and eating and, and drinking. Like, he says, no, wait for each other. We're going to distribute the bread. Everyone's going to wait. We're going to wait for each other, and then we're all going to partake at the same time. It says, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home. That you come not together in a condemnation. This shows that this isn't some huge meal. If it was a huge meal, then of course you'd come hungry, right? If you're having this big feast. You say, look, if you hunger, just stay at home. You, you know, that's not the point of having this. It's not to fill your belly. This isn't about physical food. This is about honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're doing it. It has nothing to do with having this meal. And then he says, and the rest will I set in order when I come. So he's saying... There is a lot of problems. This is a start to get them on the right path. And he's like, everything else, I'll figure it out when I get there. Flip backwards to, uh, to chapter 10 here in 1 Corinthians. This is where we're going to see the word communion. And this is one of the reasons why I, don't, I, I like the word. I don't think there's a problem with it at all. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 16 the Bible says, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers of the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the, of the table of devils. Now, what he's doing here is explaining the, the sacrifices and people who are you know, offering up sacrifices to idols and how you know, a believer shouldn't be participating in that. But in so doing, in that context, he refers to the cup and the bread that we partake in when we honor the Lord's Supper, when we, when we honor the Lord and taking the Lord's Supper or taking communion. He's saying the cup that we bless, isn't that the communion with the blood of Christ and the bread we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? What a privilege that we have, that our Lord allows us to be so closely knit together with Him in these various things that we can do, like baptism. The Bible says we're buried together with Him in baptism. We're, it's, it's a joining of ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that symbolic uh, event of, of being baptized. You're joining together with Christ as Christ died, and you're dying to self. And then partaking with Christ's resurrection and he was raised again from the dead. You're joining yourself together on him. This is all, you know, it's, it, it's symbolism, but it's important that God even gives us this great imagery. 
Because what's going to happen with the resurrection is not just symbolism. That's going to be reality where we are resurrected from the dead, where our bodies come up out of the grave and are reunited with our soul and spirit. And we have that resurrection as Jesus Christ already has been resurrected. And we get to partake in that. We have Christ, you have Christ in you. There's so many things that are very personal that when you get saved, man, that is a personal relationship with the Lord. It's so personal. It's a, it's a father-son relationship. It's a, it's a you know, parent-child, father-son, father-daughter relationship that God has with you. That is very personal. And, and it's so personal here. He's saying, you know, we're partaking with the body and the blood of Christ. We're having communion with our Lord when we... When we honor him in this way when we bless the bread and when we when we bless the, the the wine what a privilege that is turn to matthew chapter 26 we're going to see uh how this is recorded in scripture at the last supper matthew 26 verse 26 Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have extremely similar, I mean, it, it's, it's almost verbatim, it's almost exact in their account of, of this event. So we're going to just look at Matthew. Matthew 26, verse 26 says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul was referencing when he was talking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11. This is what he said. This is what he did. Verse 28, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. So this was Jesus Christ just explaining, hey, Take this bread, eat it. Here's the cup, drink all of it. He says, drink it all, drink it down. This is my blood, which was shed for you. And this is the blood of the New Testament. Now, one of the reasons why I think that John doesn't include this part of the story, he doesn't actually include the, the breaking of bread and the drinking of the wine, is because John already included the meaning behind this in John chapter 6. Turn to John chapter 6. This is, this is why I think he decided not to include it there. Obviously, it's, um, it's all the Word of God and it's under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It's God's Word. God's the author. But I don't think this needed to be added to the story because we get even more information in John chapter 6 about Jesus Christ being the bread of God and being that bread from heaven and that his, you know, of course, his body's going to be broken for us. Look at John chapter 6, verse number 31. The Bible reads, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. It's so basic and elementary that, that, that what Jesus Christ is for us, being our life, just as much as we need bread and water to survive, I mean, we need those natural elements to continue physically in this world. That's what Jesus is to us. He, is, he provides that life for us. He says, but if you come to me, he says, you're never going to hunger. We experience hunger over and over and over again. We need to keep on eating food day after day in order to continue and survive. We need to keep drinking fluids every day in order to continue to survive. Jesus says, I'm the bread and I'm that, that water or that wine. He says, I, I have that sustenance for you and you only need it one time and you're good forever. He says, once you eat of this bread, you're never going to hunger again. And once you drink, you, you will never be thirsty again, not one time. And that is 
amazing. I mean, just the, the life giver. We only need to partake one time. And that is what we commemorate and demonstrate every year is we're just showing that and, and reinforcing that. And it's something that is, is something that we don't ever want to forget. And these traditions and, and these actions that God has us doing are also very important. And we, we need to be doing them and doing them right and teaching our kids. The kids are going to grow up and, you know, oftentimes... They may not be paying attention all the time, but they see, they know that we do certain things. They know you do certain traditions. And that in itself is a teaching experience for them. And this goes down to the most fundamental level of just bread, why, you know, my sustenance. This commemorates Jesus Christ and, and he's our life. Let's jump down to verse number 47 here in John chapter 6. Jesus continues, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So we see here, this is prior to the Last Supper. This is just Jesus Christ teaching and preaching on who he is and, and that he's the bread of life. And, and this is why I think it's not all included in when John covers the, the events of the Last Supper, because he's already told them all this stuff. It's just kind of culminating at the Last Supper when he said, okay, now take and eat. Like, like he's already taught on all of this about him being the bread of life and everything like that. And, and you're never going to hunger, you're never going to thirst. And then he finally gets them all together right before he sacrificed. He said, okay, here's what you want, I need you to do right now. Just, just kind of making it more real. And just the impact of these words just hitting home as they um, participate in that, in that ritualistic type of an event. Verse number 52, The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And see, this is where the Catholics stop that I mentioned before. Oh, okay, well, I guess we need to eat the flesh and drink his blood because otherwise we can't be saved. And they'd have to come up with bizarre doctrines to say, well, I guess when we eat bread, it just turns into his flesh. Because they're blind. Because they're spiritually just completely blind and don't understand what he was saying here. Just like the Jews didn't understand what he's saying in this passage. Verse number 54, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat man and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? So he's saying, you know, even his own disciples were, were having a hard time with him saying, this is my flesh. You know, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And some of them are going, what's he talking about? This is a hard saying. But then he clarifies it in verse 63. He says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the bread. Jesus is that life. Jesus is, embodies all of that. But ultimately saying, you know, it's a spirit that quick, quickeneth means make alive. That's what's bringing the life. It's his words. It's a spirit. Uh, the spirit brings the life. And he says, the words I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. We need to receive Christ as our Savior. That's how we partake in, his, in Him being the, the flesh, you know, His flesh being sacrificed for us. It's not through the communion. On Wednesday night, when we eat the bread and, and drink the juice, that's not what saves you. We're not, we're not oh, I'm finally getting that, eat that bread. I'm never going to hunger again. No, we're just showing the Lord's death until He comes. 
You get that bread when the moment you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ where you're never going to hunger and never going to thirst again. That, that's the time when you receive that because that's the spiritual bread, the spiritual meat. You no longer need uh, anything else. You're covered by the Savior. Um, turn to Exodus chapter 12 because now I want to show some of the comparisons of, com of Passover to communion and some of the symbolism of Passover. Um, I'm going to read for you from 1 Corinthians 10. We were already looking at that passage, but in the, in the first few verses of 1 Corinthians 10, we just have one more piece of evidence that it's always been about Jesus, whether it be the Passover, whether it be communion, you know, all of this has always been about Jesus. The Old Testament has always been about Jesus. Verse number 1, 1 Corinthians 10 says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. So what are some of the differences in the New Testament versus Old Testament? You've got baptism and you've got this commemoration of the Lord's Supper. And he's bringing up both of these as basically saying, hey, this has already been. They're already baptized in the cloud with Moses. They already ate of that spiritual meat and drank of that spiritual drink, which is Christ. The same way, you know, similarly in the Old Testament as in the New Testament. It's always been by Christ. It's always been by faith. It's always been by grace. It's always been through Christ. The only difference is that they didn't know him by name. They didn't know the Christ. They didn't know the Messiah by name. Exodus chapter 12, look at verse number 3. The Bible says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Now, there's way too much here to get into all of the prophecies and everything that has to do with this. I'm going to try to limit myself to just speaking about the communion aspect of it. But you can see here that the, the Passover is, is kept on the 14th day of the month, Abib. And this, this is the same day that Jesus Christ was sacrificed. And there's so many uh, references here that talk about, that's referring to the Savior. But... Um, one of the things that they were supposed to do in this observation of Passover is that every house was going to take a lamb for their house. What it means a lamb for a house, it's for the eating. Because what they were supposed to do is eat all of it. Just like when Jesus said, drink all of it, right? They wanted to consume all of it. The bread that he gave, he said, eat all of it. The, 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 the wine or the juice that he gave them, drink all of it. He wants them to consume all of it. And what we'll see here is with the Passover is that anything that was left over was to be burnt. You, you burn the rest of it and you don't leave any of it until the morning. So the method for them separating people at the Passover, because then it was a lamb sacrifice. You are eating a full meal. That is, a, that is more of a, of a full meal which is one of the differences because the lamb was representative of Jesus Christ versus in the New Testament, it's just bread. Okay, the bread is a lot lighter. That's not a full meal. When it's the lamb, you can't have everybody together. I mean, you, maybe you could, but it would be a lot more difficult to be preparing the amount of lambs that would be necessary for everybody to partake and observe in that manner. So he had them all, everyone in their houses. And it was also a reference of them coming out of Egypt. And this is what they did when they were coming out of Egypt. I mean, they were all in their houses. Passover lamb went there. The Passover, the angel passed over the houses that had the blood and killed the firstborn son. So there's other things that were happening commemorating this whole Passover event, right? 
it, it, in the New Testament, the communion, we're looking at the, the broken body and the shed blood. That's what, it's, that's what it's all about. Passover encompassed a few more, a, a few more things. In my opinion, I think, I think it covered even more, and especially that reference back to Egypt, so, and, and being brought out, being delivered from Egypt. So the way that they practiced that is a little bit different than the way it changed into the New Testament. And, and of course it is, because you've got animal sacrifice versus just eating some bread. So let's continue on here in Exodus chapter 12. Um, Verse number seven, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. Now this is all very specific also. I just want to point that out too. This is very specific on what they need to do in, in keeping the Passover. He says, you know, you can't cook it with water. It has to be roast with fire, obviously showing the connection between Jesus Christ's soul going to hell there of making it very clear that it's roast with fire and leave none of it to the morning and it all needs to be burnt. Verse number 10, and ye shall let nothing of it remain till the morning and that which remaineth of it till, until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt." And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So this is, again, a memorial that, was, that they needed to continue to do year after year after year. That is what the, the communion is. The Lord's Supper is another memorial showing the Lord's death until he come. Year after year after year, throughout our generations, it's something that we need to teach people to do. And this is something that was passed down in the, from the children of Israel, the Passover, and it's something that's passed down today with believers in church for keeping the Lord's Supper. Jump down to verse number 41 in Exodus chapter 12. Try to hurry. There's, like I said, there's a lot of content, but I'm almost done. Verse number 41, the Bible says, And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel and their generations. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. And no strangers, it's, it's, that's a foreigner. And then it's going to give a, a little bit more of a caveat here. It says, But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. Um, in one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So when it's talking about a, a foreigner not eating thereof, it's referring to someone who's not saved. Because, it's, because then it, later on it clarifies even further and he says, okay, but any stranger that sojourns with you, any stranger, which is also a foreigner, that's staying with you, is residing in the land, he needs to be circumcised. The circumcision is the symbolic reference of salvation. That they've, that they've been circumcised, you know, they have their, their trust, their faith in the Lord. They are then allowed to participate in the Passover the same way that you're not allowed to participate in the Lord's Supper unless you're saved, unless your, your heart has been circumcised. 
those are, are the rules for that. And again, it lines up pretty well there. The Bible says then in, in Exodus 34, it's the last place we're going to look at. Because what, what coincided with the Passover, it wasn't just the lamb sacrifice, it was also the Feast of Unleavened Bread that started basically, you have the, the Passover and then the Feast of Unleavened Bread and that lasted for a week. And they were supposed to eat bread that was unleavened. I mean, no, no leaven in the bread. And he's saying, one, you need to remember that you, know, they, you ate in haste. When you left Egypt, it was something that happened real quickly. You didn't have time to prepare anything. You just kind of had to pick up and go. But there's a, a bigger reference to the unleavened aspect because leaven in the Bible represents sin. And because Jesus Christ was perfect, he was sinless, and his body represents the bread, we eat unleavened bread. And we eat unleavened bread, also we will be eating unleavened bread on Wednesday when we commemorate the Lord's Supper and we're representing the body of Jesus Christ as being sinless. And since, since leaven is, is uh, symbolized as sin in Scripture, it's unleavened bread that we're going to eat. And similarly, the wine that we drink, and I don't have time to, to go in depth on this at all, wine in Scripture is not, talk, it's not always talking about alcoholic wine. You have to get it from the context. Sometimes it is referring to alcoholic wine, and sometimes it's not. And you have to derive that from the context, but it's pretty easy to see if we're going to commemorate the blood of Jesus Christ, if we're not going to have leaven in the bread because it represents his sinless body, well, you better believe we're not going to have leaven in the wine either. And, and what leaven is to bread is what uh, the fermentation process is to wine. It's the same. It's yeast. You're adding that to it. That's what makes the alcohol alcoholic. That's what makes the wine alcoholic, is that fermentation. And that is like a poison, literally, is what, is, is what that becomes. We're not going to use poison to, commemorate, to, to symbolize the blood of our Savior, the perfect, sinless blood of our Savior. We use the pure blood of the grape, which is another reference that the Bible uses to certain types of wine. It's a pure blood. It's not been adulterated. It's not been fermented. It doesn't have leaven added to it. Exodus 34, 25 says, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. So right there, you're not supposed to be adding leaven. The wine symbolizes the blood. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. I think it's blasphemous for people to drink alcoholic wine and say that this is representing the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's the, the you know, the, the Bible refers to the, the priests of, of the day where, um, you know, it's those that are, that are drinking the wine. They're, they're going to be the people for, for that day. And I... And I I didn't have this in my notes, but um, that's what we have today in the, in the Catholic Church and in other churches where they're just drinking this wine and uh, they can't discern and, and distinguish clean from unclean. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's clean. That's good. And if we're going to recognize that and honor that, we're going to use the, the pure blood and we're going to use unleavened bread and that's how we're going to do it. There's so many different ways that um, this continuation of the Passover is representative of, of Jesus Christ. And, and it's, it's found through the, um, this observance that we observe in the New Testament. So I, I hope to understand. I know I kind of felt scatterbrained this morning. It's a big subject. It's a big topic. And it's not the most dynamic type of preaching or sermon, but it's an important one doctrinally 
that you can understand for yourself. Please study this out and, and look at it. It is that important. I mean, when we're talking about what Jesus Christ did for us, dying on the cross, sh breaking his body, shedding his blood, it is important. And we're going to take time this Wednesday to just reflect on that, respect that, and, and honor what Jesus did for us. Because, you know what, that's important too. It's easy to get caught up in the hustle and bustle and move, 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 go, go, go. And we're learning things, we're doing things. But we're going to take time and just stop and say, hey, thank you, Lord Jesus for breaking your body for us. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. And we're going to honor that and recognize that and just take time aside and just stop everything and say, this is what we're doing right now. And I also just want to make sure that everyone here is prepared that if you're going to participate, just what to expect, why we do things the way we do things, and to reflect on yourself in the next few days. Just take the time to reflect and decide, are you going to eat and drink and participate? Or do you feel like it's, you know, maybe, maybe you shouldn't. And just, just take that time. Take it seriously. And um, it's, again, it's between you and the Lord. And, and understand what it is that, uh, where you're at and, and, and how you feel you're at with, with God in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for that great gift that's been bestowed upon us, eternal life, Lord, and that the price that was paid by Jesus Christ, um, it's unimaginable to me. I, I, it's hard to see how um, you can love us so much when we've all been guilty of committing our own sins and, and transgressing against you, Lord, it's, it's hard to see how you can still love us so much to pay such a great sacrifice, but we're so thankful that you've done that. Lord, I pray that you please help us, guide us, give us wisdom and knowledge. Lord, we want to serve you the right way. We're interested in the truth. We don't want to do anything that would, um, that would just be, be wrong or that make you angry, Lord, that um, we're doing our best here to, to serve you and to do things the right way. And the way that you've instructed us to do them, Lord, help us to just continue to grow in our understanding. And God, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.